Um, well, that's me uh, in the courtroom, and uh, I was defended by Kennedy van der Laan, and that's the first case I'm going to talk about. I just skip my introduction because I think Jill introduced me very well, except for the fact that I don't live in Helsinki. I don't know um, okay. how that appeared in this program. It's kind of fake news. Yeah. Also, yeah. I just uh, information live in Amsterdam. <laughs> Um, well, here's the first case I'm going to talk about. The guy you see on the screen, that's or, uh, one of the 500 richest people in the Netherlands, and his name is Arthur Pais. He's a king in Ghana, that's why he's wearing his crown, and he presents himself as a do-gooder. Um, well, and that's me, uh, the other person on screen, and the picture he spread of me when I published my article about him. Um, this is the article. Um, it's called Paradise for Pedophiles because I discovered that this guy um, was uh, accused of abusing three minors in Ghana and that he tried to bribe his way out of court. Um, well, I thought that was news, so I decided to investigate this case, especially when uh, the dockets in Ghana went missing. Um, none of this was known in the Netherlands and on the Dutch national uh, television he presented himself as a do-gooder and he collected money for uh, projects in Ghana, uh, building schools and those kind of things um, to get more children in his uh, surroundings. Um, he knew that I was working on this story because we had several rebuttal interviews with him um, and he already announced, I will claim fucking millions, I'm now quoting him, uh, and you will sit on the blisters. Um, but although we published this in 2012, nothing happened for more than a year after the publication. Um, but, well, nothing happened in court because uh, what was going on on the ground was that there was a year of intimidation. Um, a guy specialized in martial arts and house visits, that was his profile on LinkedIn, came to our office asking for a job and later he came back um, because we had some problems with the water according to him and that's what he used as an excuse to try to enter the building. Um, Arthur Pais filed press statements about us that we were lying and that um, he was preparing a court case. Um, but when it really got dangerous was when I went back to Ghana and he tried to get me arrested. He had two policemen at his side um, he got them from the Ghanaian government for protection and he just pointed me out and said, I want these women to be in jail um, before the end of the week. Uh, I was there to work on another story and that's when I realized, okay, um, this guy is going to prevent me to do my work for the years to come. So something has to be done about this. And I was not the only one getting problems in Ghana because all my sources were accused of serious crimes. The first man was accused of uh, an attempt to murder Arthur Pais. The second one was accused of the sexual abuse of a four-year-old girl and uh, that he would have killed her for ritual purposes. And the third one was invited by uh, the criminal investigations department by the head of the anti-armed robbery squad. And uh, what he emailed me about that was, I was granted bail with conditions and one was not to give you info, as well as to write an apology letter, which I did. You are also declared wanted. So all these affairs were based on police reports filed by Arthur Pais. So he was just trying to get my sources um, in jail for crimes they didn't commit. Um, and all of this happened at the time that the Attorney General in Ghana investigated if they should reopen the criminal investigation into the sexual abuse allegations against Arthur Pais. So at this time I decided I just move forward and I um, publish a new article revealing all this before um, something bad happens in Ghana. Um, and that's when he finally decided um, to sue me. And I was actually relieved because this gave me the chance to present my evidence in court. Um, the court case was against me uh, personally and he asked uh, 100,000 euro in rectification, uh, among other things. You see them uh, on screen. Um, 
The judge dismissed all claims, the same in the appeal case. Um, she said that it was not a likely decision to accuse Paz of corruption and threats. And, um, but what I didn't realize was um, how much influence a court case would have on my uh, journalistic career. The first reason is, um, well, we are number two in press freedom, first have to say that probably in the Netherlands. So I'm quite a lucky journalist that I was brought to court in the Netherlands. But still, um, the costs we had to pay for the lawyer were about uh, 30,000 euro per case. And although we won the case, and I was lucky that my uh, boss decided to pay my lawyer, uh, the only amount of money you get back is around 800 or 900 euros. So you still have to make a lot of costs. And if you're working for a very small uh, magazine, like we are, we were with like six journalists in total, it's quite an amount of money. And then you have the appeal case again. So that's again 30,000 euro. And then I'm not talking about the time. I couldn't spend on other investigations because we had to prepare the case. Um, what, wor what worried me more was that um, how the judge would see um, the evidence we presented because it was evidence from Ghana. And how would a judge in the Netherlands see uh, a court verdict, for example, that the case in Ghana was closed? Would she see it as if I was not allowed to write about that case because the judge decided that it couldn't go on? Or would she see uh, my evidence that the case was closed because, uh, well, for example, one of the policemen involved in the investigation recently got a new car? Um, well, how would a Dutch judge weigh the Ghanaian evidence? And another thing I had to worry about was um, that Arthur Pais was using the evidence we presented to influence the court case in Ghana. So we had to present uh, Ghanaian documents, for example, mentioning witnesses in Ghana, and he went to Ghana, and then somehow those witnesses retracted their statements in Ghana, and he came with a new document, presented that in court, and, well, just how would the judge weigh that? I was lucky. Um, everything went well, and um, there was a lot of um, there were a lot of articles published about his intimidation in court. And um, well, he isn't convicted for anything, but I think um, what the story still stands. And. I'm not sure if he still has a school in Ghana or development projects, but well, I'm still happy that I wrote the story. Oh, oh. Here we go to the next case. Um, only two years later, um, I was in court again, just in public. Um, the guy uh, on the screen is Mesret Balbi. He's head of YPFTJ Netherlands. Uh, I'm not going to, into detail about the story, but the Eritrean regime is worse on the press freedom list than North Korea. And YPFTJ is the only, of PFTJ is the only party and YPFTJ is the youth department. Um, he didn't sue me. I got a lot of uh, legal threats. Um, they asked for 100,000 euro again, several times. But they didn't sue me because my articles were solid. But one person, uh, a legal ec uh, expert on uh, Eritrea and human trafficking, uh, Professor Miriam van Rijssen, she was more outspoken. And she had a small slip of tongue, or she was quite strong in her explanations on the Dutch public radio. And they uh, sued her on what she said about my article. So the court case wasn't against me, but I knew that as soon as she would be convicted, and she was one of my sources, um, they could sue me as well. And I didn't have any influence on how this court case would develop, because she was the one who had to present the evidence in court. Um, so this was quite scary, but it also had other influence um, on press freedom, because they used uh, the lawsuits um, as a method to create uh, self-censorship and censorship, because sources didn't dare to talk to me anymore because they knew that they could be brought to court and they didn't have a media organization or anyone else behind them to support them. 
Um, so they, the risk for them were even much higher if they were brought to courts. Um, same for anonymous sources, because the Eritrean regime was um, using social media to spread the word that we had to present our sources in courts. So none of the um, anonymous sources um, were sure that we wouldn't um, keep their identity uh, or keep them anonymous and that they wouldn't face any danger. And especially when it comes to the Eritrean regime uh, or the Eritrean refugees, they are quite scared for implications on families still living in Eritrea. Um, the courtroom is also being used in this case to make independent objective experts part of a conflict because um, what the Eritrean regime is doing is um, suing people who are supposed to be objective, like journalists, um, uh, lecturers, uh, experts, um, the UN um, expert on yeah, the UN special rapporteur on Eritrea. They also tried; they didn't sue her, but they uh, attacked her on social media. And when you have to defend yourself, whether on social media or in court, they claim you are no longer objective because you're one of the parties. And if this happens in a court case, the effect is magnified. So what you see um, in the Dutch media when they publish about the Eritrean regime, they don't quote objective experts anymore. They do quote them, but they um, quote their vision as being one side of the story and they present the vision of the regime as well. So this... Sunny, I'm going to yes. just interrupt and ask if you could wrap up in yes. the next minute or so, that'd be great. Thank you. And then here we go. I skipped the positive news. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and then here's the last case and I wanted to talk about this one um, because I think there are some interesting uh, questions uh, in it. It's, uh, we investigated how the US contractors and French militaries paid undocumented underage migrants for sex in Djibouti, and how the U.S. hit evidence about human trafficking and their own contribution to this in their annual human trafficking report because Djibouti is America's African front in the war on terror. We didn't end up in court for this story, but during the research process we were confronted with uh, judicial uncertainties because of the scope of the story, because it was in Djibouti, but it involved people from the US and France and Ethiopia and Somalia, and we published it in the Netherlands, but online and in English, making the story available in all these countries and thereby creating a legal limbo. And I think this will be, will be happening more in the future because there are far more cross-border investigations uh, being conducted. And even small things are different in, in, even in European countries. For example, in Germany, you are not allowed to record a conversation um, if the other party doesn't know. And in the Netherlands, you are allowed. So if you have all these different rules worldwide and you have to comply as a journalist to the most uh, strict rule um, to be safe, then this will be a risk for press freedom as well. So I hope someone here can look into that, how this can be solved. Thank you.